I was looking forward to this day that I might come here. That's right. And it, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you, thank you. Just want to get a few tidbits today. Let me just ask you, were you born in Alabama? No, I was born in Savannah, Georgia. Savannah, Georgia. Uh, and my mother and father, uh, Mr. and Mrs. George Platts, yes, lived ma'am. there and had ten children. And I happened to be the seventh of the ten. Seventh of the ten. And how much education did your parents have? My, frankly speaking, my father went as far as the third grade. But he was one of the greatest mathematicians that you could find anywhere. Mm. He even stunted the people whom he had, uh, he actually tested them because he was a contractor. They called them building, builders in those days. And he also had a wholesale and retail wood yard. Mm. And he would have to go out and find the number of trees that he wanted and have them cut and brought to in the form of, uh, of cordwood. Yeah. And uh, he had a daughter going to Georgia State College and he told her, uh, now, I, how many cords of wood can I get out of a tree that is 75 feet I'm just taking these figures. Yes, ma'am. 75 feet tall, um, maybe 30, there are three feet in diameter and, and 20 feet in circumference. How many cords of wood can I get out of it? Mm-hmm. And he gave her a chance to figure it out. She took it to school, and then she asked the teacher, is this right? And the teacher said, yes, and brought it back. My father said, now that's not right. What you do, and again, I'm just using figures. Yes. As you, what you do, you multiply the height by the circumference mm-hmm. by an, such and such a thing and divide it by the, uh, mm-hmm. uh, by the height or by the diameter, and you get the number of cards that you're supposed to get out of it. And, that's and a, he was just like, he was a genius. That's right. And my mother, both of them came from South Carolina, different parts. Okay. My father from Sumter, my mother from Beaufort, South Carolina. Okay. And uh, she went to school as high as the 10th grade. Right, right. And so were you, did you grow up in Savannah? Yes. Okay. I grew up in Savannah. Mm-hmm. I attended the public schools there. I went to Georgia State College, and I graduated from Tuskegee, at that time, Tuskegee Institute. Mm, okay. Well, my wife graduated from Tuskegee. My, Is that so? My daughter graduated from Tuskegee. Wonderful. Well, I've Wonderful. sent a lot of money to Tuskegee. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's that's, the pride, that's good to know. the pride of the stiff going south. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, you, of course, are most noted for your activity in Selma, but you are obviously pretty active even before Selma in voting rights and property ownership. Can you talk just a bit about that? Well, uh, first I came out of a family that was, my mother was an activist. She was mm-hmm. a civil rights activist before the name came in. Okay. And... Uh, in 1920 or 21, when women were given the right to vote, mm-hmm. she had a horse and buggy. And uh, she would take me with her. We would go from one house to the other. She would get the women out and take them down to the registration office. And when it was time to vote, she would take them there. And she was very active and uh, civil rights before we knew anything about it. Mm. Uh, when I graduated from Tuskegee, <coughs> I was given a position employed by the United States Department of Agriculture. And uh, I worked with the people on the farm as a home demonstration agent. Mm. 
and the people were just a cut above slavery. Mm. So my work was cut out for me there. And we, I married a man who was a county agent, and we had to. In fact, we got the people off of the farm, which, of course, caused us to be looked upon as disturbing their way of life. Mm. And uh, we had charge of the 4-H club and the adult clubs. Then we told them that you're not really a first-class citizen until you become a registered voter. Mm. And for 30 years before the much ruining of the civil rights uh, uh, struggle that we had, we, uh, we worked almost single-handedly mm. to get the people where they could register. And of course, they didn't. There were 80-some-odd registered voters when we went to Selma. And uh, I ran for Congress and during that time, in 1964, before Dr. King came into Selma, mm -hmm. there were a, around 1,035 registered voters in the whole district of eight, eight counties. Mm -hmm. The whites had, uh, there, uh, there were eight, there were, yes, a thousand some odd. The whites had, a hundred thousand some odd registered voters. And I got 10.7% of the votes that were cast, which meant I, get, I got votes from the whites as well as the blacks. So when you initially was um, the home demonstration agent uh, for the agriculture department, were you initially assigned to uh, Dallas County? Yes. Okay. Yes. Selma is the is county seat right. of Dallas County. So in, so you became, then you and your husband then uh, became outside agitators, I'm sure. Definitely so. That's <laughs> mildly saying it. Yes, yes. Because uh, if you were born in the South and if you have heard your forefathers or people in your family who lived on the farm, they can tell you some stories that would make your blood curdle almost mm. of the treatment of the people on the plantations. And see, we worked with people on plantations because most of the people in Dallas County lived on the plantations. And uh, the the plantation owners, in most cases, were those who were descendants of the slave owners. Right. And, of course, they tried to treat them the same way that their forefathers treated the slaves. How did you get this job as home demonstration agent? You know, that's something that um, makes me realize the importance of young people trying to walk a straight line. There was a home demonstration agent, no, she was the state demonstration agent in, um, in Savannah, Georgia. Mm -hmm. She married a man who was the state agent in Alabama. Were they black? And Yes. And um, I saw her only once during the years I was at Tuskegee. Then when they needed agents in Alabama, her husband said, now, we've got a tough county here, and it's hard to keep an agent, and I don't have anybody to say in that. At that time, I had graduated from Tuskegee, and I was teaching at America's Institute just a year after I had graduated. And... Is she that in said, Georgia? America's Georgia? America's Georgia, yes, yes. yes. And his wife, who was the state agent when I was a 4 club girl in Savannah, Georgia, said, you know, I've been watching a little girl from Savannah, and I have been keeping up with her, 
And I think she would make a, home, a good home demonstration agent. Now, I'm thinking how youth, the youth go about and they don't realize people are watching, watching. them. Right. Right. And from the statement that she made, I became the home demonstration agent. What, what were the responsibilities of a home demonstration agent? What did you do? What were the possibilities? No, the, the position, what kind of work did you do? Oh, do? I worked in the homes teaching people scientifically how to prepare their foods, mm -hmm. how to take care of their babies, how to clean and keep, take care of their homes, and small things like in the event that they, they become sick, mm -hmm. what to, how to direct them to the various doctors. Right. And I was supposed to teach them gardening, but they knew more about it than I did. Mm -hmm. I was not reared on the farm. I was reared in the city. Right. And those people taught me a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And I tell people so often, I got my Ph.D. through what the people in the rural district knew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they certainly knew more than I did. I had the book knowledge. Right. But they had the practice. Did you live in the rural area? While no, you I lived in Selma. You did live in Selma. Because, you see, da um, the county, Dallas County, is 700 Seven hundred plus square miles, mm -hmm. and we had to have these meetings all over the county, more than one place. Nice. So that means we had at least twenty or more communities where we mm -hmm. worked, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we would have monthly meetings in each one of these. Right. We had charge of the four H club. And we had to work also with the adults. Tell me about Bloody Sunday. Oh. <laughs> Bloody Sunday. It was a very cool, rainy day. It was, well, a misty day rather than rainy. And uh, that was because of the fact that uh, it started, I think, when I was arrested for walking down the street and I was a, a political prisoner. And Dr. King and his staff went to the house and tried to strategize what they were going to do about it. But they, because they felt that citizens were being arrested for no reason whatsoever. <coughs> and... Uh, it happened before they decided what they were going to do. A young man from Marin, Alabama, which was just 30 miles from us, was shot in the back and killed by a state trooper. And Dr. King said, uh, we are going to march to, to Montgomery and have a conference with the governor. And demand that he protect the citizens. So uh, that Sunday, March the 7th, 1965, we left the church and Lewis, John, John Lewis and Hosea Williams were leading. And I was uh, second when we left the church and a friend of mine, two women who were working feverishly because my husband had passed. And uh, we walked on through the city, and there is a bridge known as Edmund Pettus Bridge that spans the Alabama River. When we crossed the river, we saw these men, state troopers, with gas masks on, cattle prods, and clubs. And when we got across that, we just wondered, what are these people doing? We actually didn't realize 
why were these people were standing there. And uh, Hosea Williams, who was walking with John Lewis, walked on up and the person who had charge of the state troopers said, don't go any farther. Turn around and go back to your church or your home. And uh, Hosea said, may I have something to say? No, you may not have anything to say. Charge on them men. And they came from the right, they came from the left. Some few of them who were in front came from the front. And the all of these state, these, these, uh, state troopers began to beat the people. Now, there are perhaps 700 people who left the... Some of them had not even left the church. Right. But there was a, a line of people marching from the church to where we were. And they started beating them. At first, after they pushed me. And I got up. And when I got up, I saw the people running, and they were beating them because we were in front. Mm -hmm. Beating them, they fell, and they continued to beat them. Some of them I saw getting up, just limping away because of the fact that they had, some of them had broken bones. Mm -hmm. And I saw the blood on the highway. I was actually frozen. I just could not imagine human beings being treated like that. And I was stunned. When I looked around, just about everybody was gone. And one of the state troopers came up to me and he said, he hit me right across the back. And he said, run. And I just gave him a dirty look because I didn't see why I should run because I wasn't doing anything wrong. And uh, the second time he hit me was at the base of my neck, and I fell to the ground unconsciously. From then on, actually, it was nothing that I know, but having seen the pictures, having heard the, the different news media speaking about what happened to me, and because I was unconscious, and the horses, one, I understand that they tried to run the horse over me and the horse stepped over me. One guy came, and these were the state troopers. One guy came with a, pe a, a canister of, ga of uh, tear gas and began to just pump it over me. And I swallowed a lot of it, which today has changed my voice completely. And I understand that it has seared my esophagus in such a way that I will always have uh, an obstruction. Mm. And one guy just just took his, his nightstick or whatever he had and beat me. Now, I have seen that picture, and they used it in the flyer when I was running for office. But uh, a fellow by the name of Spivey Gordon, it wasn't one of his pictures, but he took quite a bit. And uh, nobody, nobody tried to help me up but one or two little, little fellows, and then they beat them. So someone back, of the, back on the other side, on the Selma side, who was standing, and they found the the uh, sheriff, Sheriff Clark, and they said to Sheriff Clark, and this fellow's name was Anderson, Morris Anderson. He said, a sheriff, there's somebody dead over there, and you ought to send an ambulance. And he said, I'm not sending an ambulance anywhere. If anybody is dead over there, let the buzzards eat them. And he said, if you don't send an ambulance over there, we are going to burn this town down. And they sent an ambulance, picked me up, and carried me to the hospital. And I was there for about 30 hours, 30 to 36 hours. And uh, when I became conscious, I said, well, what happened? And they told me, 
mm. what had happened. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I experienced that, it really gave me a greater motivation and a greater determination to fight for what we had fought for and got nowhere. Mm -hmm. What we were fighting for when in Selma to get people to get the right to vote. The meetings that we had had, the, uh, the types of, of applications that they had, which were 10 pages long and 10 questions on each page. And I said to myself that I'm going to fight because my husband lost his life fighting for them. Right. Not, they didn't shoot him, they tried to. They shot in the house and broke the big plate glass window. The, the telephone became a nuisance from 7 o'clock in the evening until around 7 at night, saying, get out of town. Your house is going to be bombed. You better not be seen on the street. And, uh, of course, he had retired because of his health, which he had a number of strokes. Mm. And... Uh, he lost his life because of the fact that uh, a man came in the, into the office to beat him. And when he, it happened that I was in his office, and when he raised the cane to do it, why, I grabbed the cane. And, but he went to the hospital for the last time, and he never came out alive. So all of these things made me more determined to carry out what we started, to make every Negro a first-class citizen by having them to become registered voters. Mm -hmm. And I, to this day, I, I continue to be motivated because we're using, we're working with young people, young people from 18 to around 25 or 27 years of age. And for look, we're in the, political field now, pulling the cover off of Cheney and off of even the poor president, mm -hmm. who in many cases he doesn't know what's going on. But uh, what's going on now in Washington, the group that I'm working with are responsible for it. We're putting out millions, millions, not, not thousands, of pieces of literature. And... Uh, We've been able to expose what Cheney has done, what uh, Libby has done, and the others. So and when we get the, through, we're going to clean up Washington, D.C. This is the, Sh the Sheila Institute. Sheila Institute. Sheila Institute. And this Tell is me, the, how did you get involved with the Sheila Institute? You know, I believe in God. And those things may happen, and we can't understand it. It happens for a purpose. My husband and I were married for four, this is my second husband, for four and a half years. The Civil Rights Bill had been passed. The Voting Rights Act had been passed. And uh, I married this guy from New York City. And we were on a trip. We just figured that, well, all of this is behind now. We will just enjoy life. We were senior citizens, and um, we just put everything behind us. And uh, we were with a friend of mine who had planned a trip to Defusky. Now, Defusky is an island where people are on there. Their ancestors were brought there, and they, they, for generations, they were still on this island. Where is this island? Okay. Big pardon? Where, where is it located? This is yeah. Defosky that is around 15 miles away from Savannah, Georgia. Mm. And the only way you could get there was by boat. Mm. And she had a program in Selma known as a radio program known as the Women's World. Who had the radio this, program? This lady was the wife of a doctor we had there whose name was Maddox. Her name was Gloria Maddox. And she asked me, would I 
like to go because they were going to spend the night in, uh, in Savannah. And I said, sure, knowing that I still had a few friends who were living there. Right. So she um, had made all of the arrangements with one of the captains. Mm -hmm. And when we got to Savannah, she said, he said that all of his boats were out, but I'll put you in care of a man who lives in, uh, on the, the Defusky Island. And we went down to the arena, and he put us in charge of this guy. And the boat was around 15 or 16 feet long, and there were six of us. And we, we started out, and there were certain places that I recognized because we would go down, what we call down the river on picnics. And we had just passed the waving girl that I spoke of and the pass where the big boats come from uh, Boston, from Massachusetts, New York, going into Savannah. And there, they would come into the river from the ocean. We had just passed that specific place when a large boat, disrespecting the small craft, just went through the, the, the water. And the first wake or wave just filled the boat, almost filled the boat with water. And the second turned it over. And here we were trying to the thing about it, we didn't have on life jackets, and we could not swim. And this water, the, the temperature was 42 degrees. We were washed away from the water, all except Gloria, the one who had the program, and my husband. And they were holding on to the boat. I saw the, the man who owned the boat with his head down, but he had on a life jacket. And I knew that there was no way that he could survive. And every time a wave would come, it would wash us farther away from the boat. And my husband kept on saying, are you all right? And I said, yes. I knew he was all right because he was holding on to the boat. How were you staying afloat? God, God sent his angels to hold me up. That was the only thing. And there was one uh, that was also in the boat, and she said, Oh, Boynton, don't let me drown. Don't let me drown. God, don't let me drown. I had no, it's, it's the funniest thing, I had no fear that I would drown. I kept on saying to God that I can't afford to drown. I have too much to do. And I can constantly say that. And I wasn't thinking about what I had to do because I didn't know. And... Um, when uh, uh, a boat came, uh, about they said it was 20 minutes that we were in that water, not being able to swim. And this is a big river where the big boats mm. come into that river going to Savannah. And my husband, I didn't hear his voice anymore. And when they began to pick us up, there was a small boat coming from the Hilton Head Island, they had these students from eight years old to 15, and they were on an ecology trip. And they saw, one of them saw us, one of them said, look at that stuff in the water. And another one said, well, it has life. And then the boat came to us, picked us up, and carried us to the hospital in Hilton Head Island, and the first thing I said was, where's my husband? They said, we haven't found him. The boat went down, and he went down too. Now, he was an electronic technician. He lived in New York until we married, and he came down, and he brought all of this expensive equipment. And uh, later on, I asked somebody in Tuskegee, to find somebody to evaluate this material that he had, this equipment. And uh, the lady told me, well, I found somebody. And it happened to be a man whom I remembered 50 years previously when I was in school. 
And I said to him when he came up, are you an electronic technician? He said, no, the guy couldn't come, and I didn't want to disappoint you. So I came. And uh, we talked a while, and in the talking, I expressed the fact that I was having some, some uh, interior decoration done in the house, and the man had left. And he said, the man had gone to Cincinnati and just left the work half done. And he said, well, if he doesn't come back, I'll come back and I'll finish it for you. And uh, he came back and he finished it. And when I asked him how much it was, he said, you want me to stop? Just one second. Okay, so he, he said, came back. I, I, I'm not charging you anything. Will you marry me? And out of, I thought he was joking. And out of the clear skies, I said, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so he went on back to Tuskegee and got the ring and the minister and the license, and we were married. Now, I like to travel. And he said, Let's go to New York to the Shriners meeting. Now, he wasn't a Shriner. And I said, okay. So we went to the Shriners meeting, and we couldn't get in the Shriners meeting. But we were looking at the displays of the various companies. And a guy came up to me, and he started talking. And I wondered why was he talking to me instead of my husband. But I heard him when he said, and we have a blueprint to put water across the Sahara Desert and cause it to bloom again. And I thought about California and how it was arid and how it was, uh, uh, had no water and they built it up. And I said, well, if my husband were living, he would, he would approve of something like that. Then he said, uh, we... We have now a section of the city of New York where we are trying to drive drugs out of it. And he invited me to come to this meeting that they were going to have with the people in that particular area or community. And I invited him to come to Tuskegee, where my husband and I were uh, in charge of the tourists. And... Then he invited me to go to a meeting that they had in Virginia. And I had never heard, with the exception of what he said, I had never known anybody by the name of Lyndon LaRouche. But when he told about the program and when I heard him speak, I saw that he was political, he was an economist, and the things that he was doing, instead of working with his people, he was working with everybody internationally. And the program is one, just what we are doing now. Politically, we have pulled the cover off of Cheney, off of all of the people who were backing the president. And we are exposing what's happening in the, with the war, with the beginning of the war. And I began to realize when I told God that I had something to do and had nothing to do, he gave it to me. And that is to work with Schiller Institute, which is the name of the organization, and the Lelouch Youth Movement. And I, I don't get tired. That's one thing. I like what I'm doing, and I don't get tired because I'm seeing the result. Right. The, the, the youth movement is made up of young people, young people who want to do something and who want to be somebody. And many of those young people have been in drugs. Many of them have been at the crossroad because they had, didn't know what way to turn. Many of them are people from broken homes or from foster homes, and they want to be somebody and want to do something. And when I have some of them to come up to me and say that I was going, I was on the wrong path, I was in drugs, 
and now I see that it was destructive. And I have come into this organization, and when I hear you talk, I feel that I can make it, and I'm going to make it. And it makes me feel good. I know. And I tell them that you give me more than I give you, because you give me the determination to continue to do what I do, and you even give me youth, mm. because it's not how I look. I feel 100% better than I look. <laughs> So they really helped me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I think when I told God that uh, I had too much, I feel as though he is actually helping me to do the thing that uh, shows that we can't lay down and die because of age. Mm -hmm. And he gives me the strength to continue to go on. Well, Mrs. Robinson, I want to thank you for taking your time. I could sit here and talk with you and listen to you for for hours on hours. <laughs> uh, we we know that you've had a long flight and you need to probably get some rest before the event this evening. Yeah. So I just want to, you know, thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing. And, thank you. Uh, God when I leave here, you. when I leave here, I'm going to Oakland to a group of young people there who are expecting me. Yesterday, I went to two of the universities, and of course, I got back rather late and sat up and talked, Mm -hmm. and in fact, I had almost no sleep. I slept on the plane, Right. Right. and uh, when I leave here tomorrow, I'll fly into Oakland, and then I'll come back to, to Los Angeles, then I'll leave out of Los Angeles a day afterward, and I'm going to, I'm going directly to um, to uh, Rome, where my book has been printed in the Italian language, mm. mm-hmm. and they are planning on having some type of uh, public service there. Mm. That's big. And from exciting. there to Germany, and I don't know where else. Mm. So but, you're, you're going out on tour then. Uh, Yes. Uh, That's great. Again, thank you so much for for your time. uh, You're welcome. We will, hopefully, I'll be able to do this again sometime when we have more time. Okay. Thank you so much. All right.